Peter, I've gone ahead and made you co-host. So no you should. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> In, uh, <laughs> um, it means you should be able. Uh, are you pulling my leg? I have not been the the. You know, I've run my own little my own little zooms, but never with this much hoo ha. Ah, okay. So I'm the host. I control almost everything. Uh, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen and <coughs> run your um, presentation. Yeah, so I see your. I see a, 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 a screen up right now that looks like a. I don't, know what, I don't know what kind of a, it's a graphic. Here and um, <clears throat> maybe I do something here. Put the light behind it. <clears throat> There's always the whole dealing with the bullshit of lighting. Yes. And I have this weird, because of where my, my stuff sits, I have a, uh, <clears throat> a little beam of light over my shoulder here. All right. Um, I'm going to bring up my, uh, this, bang. Excellent. Yeah. So are we the only two that can hear each other? Uh, everyone else should be able to hear us. All right. Um, but we hey, should be the only ones that are allowed to. All right. So I can't. I can't say radical things about them then. Uh, Mark, uh, you haven't uh, muted yourself yet. Can you hear us? I can hear you, Tony. Okay, great, excellent. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and uh, <coughs> mute. So you go play with your bees today? I have not. I'm going to go in on Sunday when it's warm and take off my uh, final Formic Pro treatment. Uh, I've done my, um, I had to go down to the farm today because I had to pick up a bunch of vegetables. So I took a peek out there and I had some planks of, you know, EPS that I threw on top of some of my hives and strapped them down. But mm -hmm. the final, the final insulation has not happened yet. So, when do you do that? Um, what's going to happen is once this little weather spate has gone by, mm -hmm. I'm going to um, do the thing where I I, I have a bunch of pre-built um, you know plank sets that get strapped around my hives. Yep. I'm redoing my um, my uh, what do you call it? Um, Blah blah. What's this stuff called? The coroplast. Yep. And so <clears throat> I'm going to redo that kind of stuff and make mm -hmm. make that all ready to go. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm making a, making ones that get they sort of fold over the top uh -huh. of the hive in both directions, so yep. that they just they completely cover the entire hive. And because last year when I did this thing, I had these ones that I could they were round, and then yep. when I tried to pop them open, they were didn't work so great. They were pain in the ass. So, but. so I saw on uh, I don't know whether it was Better Bee or one of the, one of the mail orders. They have um, essentially what what you and I did last year, which was right. um, the 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 four sheets and then the chloroplast. But they had the four sheets encased in, in in sheets of vinyl, so it was sort of one long long black sheet that I, I assume had Velcro on the ends that. You would, yep. It was all encased, but it was only at a uh, one inch thick um, insulation. So it was just R5. Yeah. And, um, so, I've, yeah I've, I've seen some stuff like that. And I've, I've got a, a buddy out in the, in the Detroit area, a beekeeper out there that I've, that I met him at the very first EAS that I went to. And uh, we've, we, we meet up at every, at one of these, at all these meetings that we end up going to, I ended up, you know, hanging around with him when we were up at, uh, at uh, Apomondia. So he's a good buddy. And he gets, being close to Canada, 
the, the I think it's the Ontario Beekeepers Association, they have these little coroplast things that fold flat. You know, they're kind of like a, they're, they're basically a cardboard box, but they're made out of coroplast that they all yes, come flat yes. and they, they sell them for a few bucks and, you know, you can buy a stack of them and they're meant to fit around, you know, either single or double deeps. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty nice solution. You know, it's a quick and dirty thing to do. So, yeah, I, I sort of copied uh, one of their designs and um, I've got Velcro on that, one of those large sheets of chloroplast that I yeah. purchased off of you and I pre-folded it, but I was uh, a little too tight on the tolerances. So I think if I had given it an extra quarter inch on each side, I would have been better off, but yeah. they seem to work well. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I thought it was going to be all smarty pants about this and uh, have them so that they were really snug and everything. And it was just, a, it just was a hassle. So yeah. I, I, and I found out that, that I'm going to, you know, there are probably at least one time in the middle of the winter where I go in there on a, and hit them with OA. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I got to be able to get down to the, down to the boxes. And I have all my whole, all my boxes have, um, are pre-drilled and they have a plug in them so I can just get to the, 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 the one that's in the middle of the hive, pull the plug, stick my Oxivap in there. Oh, that's right. That's right. And shoot them. It takes me about a minute and then I can move on to the next hive. And so I just go along and have everything ready to go, pull the cover, hit them with OA, close it up, move to the next hive. And so, you know, as I go through my, you know, right now I've got about 10 units that I would have to do between mm -hmm double nukes and hives and that'll take me you know i can get that done in an hour yeah so that's that's not so bad excellent, excellent. Yeah. so we're almost there we're going on um uh, mcba time we'll give MCBA. it another three minutes or so that's cool so this one's going to come in at about well i hope to hit about 20 minutes okay it's you know i'm going to yeah. Just so we'll have question and answer and happy to talk with anybody about any of this stuff. Um, and if somebody needs or wants to, I can send them a reference list. So I can, I can send you a slide or something that you can then post if you want to have a reference yeah, list. Yeah, that'll be great. So. Are you the, yeah. the black and white bumblebee or the black and white honeybee? That's me for now. Uh, I didn't like having a picture up for all of my daily work picture, uh, meetings. So yeah, I decided understand. to go anonymous. This, the Zoom thing has been a useful tool. and uh, But there's an interesting thing about that. And that is that people seem to figure that they that anybody can zoom anytime. It's kind of like mm -hmm. how they hear that you're always waiting at the other end of your email. Yes. That can be a little problematic. Definitely, definitely is. I, I, I although I, I eagerly look for forward to the day when we return to in-person meetings. That's oh my God, whenever I go into the lab, I, uh, that's my, one opportunity to go in, I, you know, I only have to go in, well, I don't have to, but I go in about one to two days a week. And that's when I get a chance to work on, uh, you know, electronics projects or physical construction things that I have to build for the lab equipment that I make. And, uh, but it's also the time when I get a chance to see people face to face. And I get so much more done when I can talk to somebody face to face rather than sort of wrestling it out over, you know, text or email. Mm -hmm. So. It's Definitely. a much better solution. So, okay, <clears throat> well, I think we've got a, a good quorum present, so you can go ahead and uh, get started whenever you're ready. Sure. Um, are there folks out there who can hear me? If you just wave a hand, I can tell them I'm making contact here. Yes. Awesome. We, we can hear you, Peter. Yeah. I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, so um, my name is Pete Frickman. Um, I have been a member of Middlesex County Beekeepers Association. I'm currently a member of Norfolk County Beekeepers Association, even though I live in the southernmost range of Middlesex County. I live pretty much within spitting distance in Norfolk County, and it's easier for me to drive to those meetings than it is for me to go all the way up to Concord. But 
you, you guys are a good crowd and I've always had nice times meeting with you and you run a good organization. And I know Tony pretty well because we've been doing a lot of studying together for um, a Master Beekeeper course. So anyway, um, I run it at, at a small apiary down in Dover that's called Game of Drones Apiary. And uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about ventilation and insulation. How do vent can ventilation and insulation impact colony health and, and energy efficiency? And whenever I see an article about the biggest problems for bees, there are two things that always are at the top of the list. First one is always Varroa and the associated problems that they bring with them. And then it's nutrition and the lack of it, particularly in winter. And uh, we're gonna, tonight we're gonna review several studies that have investigated the effects of humidity on honeybee and varroa reproduction. And we're gonna look at the energy cost of converting nectar into honey. Um, bees are, we all know that bees are really remarkable and resilient animals and they're clearly able to adapt and survive and even flourish in the artificial habitat that we as beekeepers provide for them. And this talk is not gonna claim to tell you the best way to care for your bees, that's up to you. And as a beekeeper, what I've found out is that your goals for what you want from your bees, they may be in conflict with the bees, what might be optimal for your bees. An example of this is that the vast majority of beehives are designed for the benefit of the beekeepers and uh, not for the bees. And in any case, you may find that some of these management ideas can be you know, a benefit to both you and your bees. So let's see if we can get this thing going here. Um, What's humidity? At any given time, there's a certain amount of water vapor present in the air. And this amount of moisture in the air is expressed as relative humidity, which is the percentage of the maximum amount of water vapor that the air can hold at any given time, at any given temperature. Now, when air is cooled to the temperature where it's saturated with water, with water vapor, it's said to be at its dew point. And the closer that the air temperature is to the dew point, the more humid the air is. Humidity is always linked to a, temp to a temperature of the environment. Now, this is an example from earlier in the month, certainly not today. Um, if you take a look at this, the red line is the air temperature and the green line up here in this upper graph, this is the dew point and the relative humidity is down here in, this, in the bottom part of this graph, okay? So if you, if you take a look at this, early in the morning, both the air temperature and the dew point were at 48 degrees Fahrenheit and the air was completely saturated with water. It was in fact at 100% relative humidity. And later in the day, as the temperature rose, you can see that the relative humidity plummeted, okay? And the dew point remains stable, relatively stable all day long. So as the temperature goes up, relative to the dew point, the humidity in the air as a percentage of it drops down. Okay, so in contrast, you know, th this is one of those things that we all see, you know, it's like if you're uh, around here during the summertime and you have one of those days and the, and the weather guy goes and he says, you know, the dew point is 65 degrees. We all in New England know that we're in for a pretty miserable night of sleeping. So this is kind of reflective of that sort of thing. Well, let's review what heat is. Heat is a form of energy that's associated with the kinetic energy of atoms or molecules. And temperature is the measure of that average kinetic energy of the, of the atoms or molecules in the system or the object that's being measured. It's important to understand that heat is only transferred from an object that is higher in temperature to an object that is lower in temperature. And if the two objects are the same temperature, there's gonna be no transfer of heat. Now this is a schematic of a beehive and it shows examples of heat transfer occurring in the context of beehive. Now down here at the bottom in a brood nest, the heat is transferred from the bees by conduction into the wax of the combs that those bees are, their bees are in contact with. And then the heat is transferred via convection as the air inside the hive is warmed and it becomes less dense and it rises up inside the hive. And when this air temper, and when this air, warmer air rises and encounters colder objects within the hive, that heat is transferred from the warm air to the colder objects via conduction. And the third measurement or the third method for transferring is radiation. An example of that is gonna be when the heat from the sun warms the surface of the beehive. Okay, so what about ventilation? Ventilation is the movement of air within a space and also the movement of air from one space to another. And in beehives, there are two main forms of ventilation. There's passive ventilation, which is caused by convection currents due to the heated air rising within the hive. And then there's mechanically assisted ventilation and that can be caused by the fanning of the bees within the hive or by a device maybe that the beekeeper has added, added onto that hive. Now, you know, let's just think about what purpose does ventilation serve in a beehive? Well, right off the top, 
The bees use it to control temperature and to control humidity within the hive. They also control it to distribute the pheromones throughout the colony so that they know what the, the, the reproductive status of the queen is. Another thing that happens is they use it as a way to move or to change the concentration of the carbon dioxide inside the beehive. And one of the things that plays to our advantage as beekeepers is it serves to, dis to disperse the chemical treatments of you know, the Varroa treatments that we all end up using. Let's take a look at some data here showing active ventilation by the fanning of bees. If you look at figure A in this particular slide, you see that's over here in this corner. You can see that there is cold air moving into the hive on the right-hand side of, the, of the, the colony, on the landing board, and there's gonna be warm air moving outside of the colony here on this side. There's a little camera up here that's gonna show us what's going on over here. But down here on this in, in the section B, you can see so broad section of it is colder air. That's this blue color. And the, over here on the, on, the, on the coming out side, on the left side is a hot air coming out of the hive. And over here on this picture, which is taken from this camera, you can get a clear view of the bees lined up on the bottom board, fanning actively to drive that warm air out, out of the hive. And they're actively controlling the humidity and the temperature inside of the colony that they're working in. So, they're doing a crackerjack job of running this beehive and, and, and dealing with the environmental conditions inside of it. They are, in fact, quite actively in control of what's going on here. So what are the environmental conditions in a beehive that are favorable for bees? And what are the conditions that are favorable for Varroa? Well, this is a, a study that was done in 1976. And these guys, they took 12-hour-old honeybee eggs and exposed them to various humidity levels at 35 degrees centigrade. That's about body temperature for us. After 24, 24 hours, the, temperature, the eggs were examined to see what percentage of those eggs had hatched into normal larva. The data here in this, in this graph demonstrates that the eggs that were reared in that 90 to 95% relative humidity milieu had the highest proportion of normally developing larva. Okay, so here we have a clear example of how humidity can affect the, the development of eggs. Now the authors of this next slide they went and this is talk about nitpicky work here. They went and they infected freshly capped brood cells with a single adult female varroa mite. And these cells were exposed to different levels of relative humidity during the development of the bees. And they found that those cells that were raised in the higher humidity atmosphere produced fewer varroa mites. You can see down at the bottom that 79 to 85% relative humidity thing only yielded about 4% of the, of the mites made it on to, to be adults. Okay, now this elevated level of humidity, as it turns out, is well within the normal bounds that are seen within um, beehives. You know, it's, it's nothing extraordinary. It's not like these guys were jacking the, the humidity level up to something radical here. So as we go along here, let's take a look at this next study. This one's a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll, we'll kind of go through this thing. It, these guys, they put samples of 300 bees and, four, and 40 varroa mites into to sample chambers here, and then they expose them to ventilation rates, three ventilation rates, a high rate, a medium, medium rate, and a low ventilation rate at either 10 or 25 degrees centigrade. And what they found out was that as the, as in, in the, the bees were not affected by any of the changes in this thing. Their mortality was similar for all the ventilation rates at both temperatures, but varroa mortality was significantly elevated at the warmer temperatures with a lower ventilation rate. And this is where the carbon dioxide level was the highest. And this study demonstrates that the conditions at, at the conditions of 25 degrees centigrade and with restricted ventilation, this can result in elevated levels of carbon dioxide. And this has the potential to substantially increase varroa mortality. So here's an example, that's as an example of how the, the atmosphere inside of the, the beehive can be manipulated to, um, We've seen it now that can be manipulated to favor the bees and disfavor the varroa mites. Now, ventilation is often cited as a method for controlling moisture buildup in beehives. New beekeepers are taught from the very get-go that it isn't cold temperatures that kill bees, but it's moisture. And this message makes sense when you look at the traditional wooden beehives. These hives provide very limited resistance to heat flow. And when the warm, humid air inside of the beehive rises, it comes in contact with the wooden sides at the top of this enclosure. And if the temperature of the enclosure is at or below the dew point, moisture will condense onto the cold surfaces. And when this happens, liquid water forms on the walls and the underside of this inner cover. This condensate can run down the walls. And if enough condenses onto the inner cover, and you can see one down here below, it could drip down onto the frames of the bees. 
Now, by venting moist air out of the beehive, you can limit the amount of water that can condense onto the cold inner surfaces of the beehive structure. But this comes with a significant cost. The more air that the bees vent out of the beehive in an attempt to limit the condensation, the more heat they lose to the environment and the more honey that they need to consume to raise the internal temperature of the, of the hive. And this is a demonstration of the interplay of the control of humidity via ventilation and the concomitant law, heat loss that comes with moving warm, humid air outside of that beehive. Now, insulation provides resistance to heat flow or energy transfer between objects. Um, if we look at R values, this is an R value is a way for us to express the insulative quality of a material. And a, a, the higher the R value of a material, the more effective an insulator it is. And take a look at this graph over here, this chart over here. You can see that tar paper, which loads of people wrap their beehives in, has pretty much zero um, insulative value. If you put bubble wrap around it, that jacks up to pretty high content. It's all bubble wrap is almost as um, insulative as the as, as a, a, a the thickness of of uh, or this insulative quality of, of of wood, you know, of softwoods. But if you put polystyrene around a beehive, you have much higher levels of insulation. Now these are values that are out here in in R values per inch. Okay. So let's take a quick look at the insulation quality of two divergent structures that bees can live in. One is a typical wooden beehive, which has a R value right around one. And then you can compare this to a tree cavity and the R value for the 15 centimeter thick walls of the, of the, 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 the tree cavity is right around 8.6 or more than eight times the insulative value. And if you look at the top of the, the beehive, this huge stack of wood up here at the top, pretty much essentially makes an infinite amount of insulation. And there are other notable differences in, 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 in these tree cavity hives that are unlike um, you know, conventional um, beekeeper used um, colony enclosures, you know, beehives. And that is the control of airflow. Most beehives, um, if, you ever, if you read Tom Seeley's work, you can, you know, he, he has laid out what pretty typically wild bees will look for, what feral bees will look for. And they're looking for a cavity that has an entrance at the bottom and not at the top. And so the, the warm air rises inside of this colony here and there's no way for it to get out. So these are bees that functionally have no top entrance to their beehives, okay? So let's take a quick look here and think about what goes on inside of a beehive. Bees spend vast resources on collecting nectar and processing it into honey. There's a fellow in England, a guy named Derek Mitchell. He's a thermal fluidics engineer, and he has recently published a series of articles that model the energetics of nectar processing and how the physical environment of the hive directly imp impacts this process. And he summarized his work in a lay article in Bee Culture of the 20, 22 of May, 2019. Let's go ahead and do a, a little walk through an example that he posts about the energetic cost of honey processing. These next diagrams are gonna be used to visualize the amount of nectar and the energy that is needed for the colony of bees to produce 10 kilograms or 22 pounds of honey. Now here you can see in this thing, in this diagram, that 10 kilograms of, of honey contains about eight kilograms of sugar and two kilograms of water. Um, if we assume that our bees collect nectar that has about a 20% sugar concentration, then 10 kilograms of 20% nectar contains about two kilograms of sugar and eight kilograms of water. So to produce our 10 kilograms of honey, the bees are gonna to need to collect 40 kilograms of 20% nectar. So remember, they've got, we've gotta to get to eight kilograms of sugar here. And what's the energetic cost of this evaporation? Well, at zero degrees centigrade, it takes about 0 0.67 kilowatt hours of energy to evaporate a single kilogram of water. Now to evaporate 30 kilograms of water is gonna evaporate 20, 30 times that amount or 20.1 kilowatt hours of energy. Now the fuel source for this is sugar and there's approximately 4.4 kilowatt hours of energy in a single kilogram of sugar. So uh, the math works out and it's gonna take the energy of about four and a half kilograms of sugar to, to provide the energy to do this evaporation. And that comes out to be the amount of sugar in 22 kilograms of 20% nectar. Okay. Bang. Here, this is what it adds up. We can see that to get to our 10 kilograms of honey, 
the bees are going to need to process 40 kilograms plus 22 kilograms of, uh, or, you know, so, see here we have 62 kilograms of nectar. And this assumes that this process is a perfectly efficient conversion with no thermal losses. Unfortunately, that's not the case. For Mi Derek Mitchell, he, is, that he assumes that the bees live in a typical wooden bee hive and that they live at a more realistic temperature of 25 degrees. Remember, we looked at a 40 degree temperature conversion. And based on these assumptions, he further assumes an efficiency of about 50%. If this is the case, and these are these numbers are pretty realistic, this is going to be pretty much right down the line of what all the modeling says. The bees are going to need to double the fuel cost to 44 kilograms of energy to make up for the lost energy. This means that the bees are going to need to process a total of 84 kilograms of nectar just to get to our 20 kilograms of honey. This is a staggering effort that the bees have to make to get to make their process to process their honey. Further, this calculation is done for just a single energy efficiency and a temperature and makes the assumption, this is the kicker, it makes the assumption that the bees fly zero distance to forage. So this doesn't even account for the amount of energy that they fly, that they spend in flying to forage. Okay, we all knew that our bees worked hard, but maybe not this hard. So what can a beekeeper do to help make this process more efficient? As it turns out, the largest inefficiencies in this evaporative process are due to heat losses from the hive that can't be applied to the work of evaporation. And these heat losses occur when heat escapes through the walls and the structure of the hive and by convective losses from heat escaping from the hive. And the easy way to limit these heat losses is to insulate the beehives. By insulating the hives, the efficiency of the nectar to honey conversion will improve and the bees will be able to limit their energy that they expend on processing nectar. And there are loads of ways to easily insulate your beehives without needing to buy new hives made of polystyrene or some other kind of plastic materials. Here you can see some simple solutions that only take a, a trip to the home improvement center to buy yourself some sheets of two inch thick expanded polystyrene foam board. And by cladding your boards in, in, in uh, polystyrene material, you can increase the insulation of a typical three, three quarter inch wooden hive by about eight times. By connecting the panels using construction tape, you can effectively eliminate air leakage due to the wind. Now there are other materials that have proven effective at insulation in beehives. There's some of those are the, the cozies that you see wrapped around some kinds of beehives. Some of them are, you see these big black ones. Uh, we have one on the next slide here, you can see. Um, these guys are wrapped around, they have fiberglass insulation inside of a big plastic bag. Those are really effective at doing that as long as they don't get wet. If they get wet, they pretty much are useless. So what you're really looking at is to, to, to get your insulation around your hives is to find ways to have, keep your hives, hives dry and get the insulation values up. Another material that I use, I mean, Tony uses this stuff, are, are those, you know, those lawn signs that you find out in the, in front of, and we don't see a lot of them right now, they're for the politics things that are going on. It's called coroplast. It's essentially a plastic material that behaves like corrugated cardboard. You can fold up a, uh, one of these corrugated guys, you can buy a sheet of this stuff for pretty short money and cut up pieces, fold them up and stick them right around your beehives. Um, and that can help keep everything uh, sealed dry. A lot of folks in the past have used tar paper. And uh, if you ever have ever, um, you know, you know, looked at some other beekeepers, they use put wrap tar paper around them. What they're really doing is they're preventing wind from um, robbing the heat from the hive. It's not really an insulation issue. They're just, they're relying on on a huge amount of sugar inside the beehive to provide the energy and they're eliminating the amount of, of uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, wind leaks and that kind of business. So hang on a second here, boom, boom. So while the evidence is, uh, while the evidence is not conclusive, there is evidence that eleva elevated humidity in the brood nest favors beeper re reproduction and higher CO2, hang on a second here, I gotta, I'm having a brain fart here that these higher levels of higher humidities and higher levels of CO2 res resulting from lower ventilation values may limit the Varroa reproduction. But the big message that, that I wanna give, give in this talk is that by using hives in, that are better insulated and less leaky, you may substantially impact the ability of your hives to make honey with less metabolic work. So um, thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and uh, Let's go forward. So P uh, Peter, I had a, a question from a member asking about the polystyrene hives, the Lysin and the Apame. Yeah. And I, I, if I recall correctly, you have 
you have one of those. Actually, um, I have both of those kind of hives. Okay. Uh, could you give a, a sort of your thoughts on those versus the standard Langstroth? Um, yeah. So I have, uh, if, if you get, take the time to look online, you'll find a company called Apame, A-P-I-M-A-E. They're actually made in Turkey. There's a company here in the United States that imports them to the United States. And those are rotomolded um, polystyrene hives with expanded polystyrene in between the walls. And they're, they're very nice beehives from a structural standpoint. They're built, built for commercial beekeeping. Um, and they're really super durable hives. They have, they come with all the bells and whistles and they're really nice. And they have a very high insulation capacity. If you look on this slide that I have up here on the screen right now, this one down here that I'm kind of waving my cursor at, those are our Listen polystyrene hives. They just happen to be painted a brown color. Um, you can buy those through, I think, I think that Better Bee sells them. Better Bee also sells polystyrene, expanded polystyrene hives themselves. A Better Bee, or they, I, think, I think the brand name is B Max. Um, both, all, both of these things are superior in insulation quality to other beehives. I have to be honest, I have a, uh, I have a set of Listen polystyrene nukes that I've used. Um, they're six frame nukes, they're really great. The only, my only knock on them is that the entrance to the, to the, the beehive over about three years, the bees going in and out of the beehive have somehow managed to erode that, that slot into a bigger hole. So the, the little gate that they, that they provide you with, eh, the bees can pretty much sneak right through. Um, but I'm gonna try to use some shugu or something like that to build that bottom lever, layer up into a, a, a more durable sill and we'll see how that goes. Um, that provide the information those folks were after. Happy, happy to sure. chat. I, I think so. I, um, oh, I, I want to say one thing here. about the APMA hives, just one little quick shot. One of the things that I like about the APMA hives is they actually come with a built into the bottom board is a pollen trap that you can put in or out just by sliding a panel in and out of the bottom of the hive. So you can put it in for a couple of days and take it out, collect your pollen and then not interfere with your bees. And the other thing that they do is they come with a set of feeders that are built into the top of the thing. You can choose to use them or not use them. You can use them with either solid food or with liquid food. I realize I'm sounding like a salesman. That's not my intent. It's just that I found these tools, these to be a very useful tool and they come ready to go. So they're pretty nice. They're Excellent. expensive. I will tell you that they are expensive. So. We have some questions in the chat that I can um, either read or if people want to unmute themselves and ask, I'll sure. just call on you one by one and That's great. people can ask their questions. Uh, Philip, you had the first question. Well, Peter, thank you for this. It's quite interesting. Um, the diagram you showed where the airflow on the inside on the right, the air, airflow exit on the left, is that pretty universal for all hives? Well, it, if actually I'm going to pop up to that that diagram here. I think it was, is this a slide you were talking about? Um, yes. So this is uh, this is what you see in a basic Langstroth, Langstroth hive. If you look at the entrance of your hives on a warm day, you'll see the bees are kind of stacked up on one side. Um, especially if you have a wide entrance. I'm one of these beekeepers. I all year long run a very narrow entrance. Um, I find that it's easier for my bees to defend the hives and I've never, never really needed where I keep my bees, truth be known, pretty crappy forage. So they're not like, they're not like waves of bees roaring into the hive needing to have a lot of landing space. Um, so if you have a big landing board, you're going to see this kind of thing going on. They kind of, they need, they need to push the area in on one side and pull it out on the other side. Sure. Bija, um, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, you had a question for Peter or a couple questions for Peter. Go for it. Well, hi there. I have, um, I have two ape in my hives and I was curious how big the entrances should be for winter, but you just explained it that you keep it kind of low all the time. Yeah, you know, was I, I, can, I, I, can, I was just out of my apiary today and I can tell you that what I've done is as we've gone into autumn, I've brought those guys down to where there's, I have two slots on either side of the central. You know how they have those little gates? Yeah. And so you can, you can click them down. I only leave one or two of those entrances open on either side. And mostly it's right. as a mouse guard. 
And right, right, me too. And what do you do though? I was just thinking because I'd been feeding them syrup. The last time I went in and pulled some frames up, there was a lot of uncapped syrup. And I'm just thinking, geez, that's a lot of syrup to still try to dry out. You're right. If I close up the entrance, you know, isn't that reducing the amount of airflow that they can produce if they're trying to fan those things dry? Let me ask you a question. Are your bees still taking syrup? Well, I've stopped feeding them because the hives were pretty heavy and I saw so much syrup packed away. I just kind of stopped because I did, I was feeding them through all of October. Yeah. I mean, the, my guess is if you keep track of the weight of your hives, I'm, I'm, you gotta understand, I'm one of these nut jobs who has a scale under every, under every hive and temperature probes inside of them. So <laughs> I'm a research scientist. My life is all about numbers. And I uh -huh. believe that you should, that beekeepers, that, that this beekeeper should make his decisions based on data. And uh, mm -hmm. so I keep track of what's going on in my beehives. And if you ever get the chance to look at the data, um, the, you know, at, at the, the data in a beehive, actually, let me do something here. Right, we're gonna go and have a little little bop here. Tony, is this coming up on the screen there? Uh, no. We may need to. Um, uh, right now, we see your presentation. You see, you may need to change the. Oh, I know. I'm gonna go. Back. Can I just? Uh, I'm gonna stop the share. Is that yep. what I? Do? So I'm gonna stop the share, and I'm gonna go back to share the screen, and I'm gonna open up this. All right, so these are live views of my hives. Hmm. And uh, so you can see here, this, this is, this is a, a beehive and these, this is the weight in the beehive. And you can see that every day the bees bring in, in the, this is actually the bees, they, they leave the hive in the morning and then they bring weight in, that's bees coming back into the hive. And then wow. they go through this process of dehydrating the, 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 the stuff and then they go out and they get more. So one advantage of having having these scales under your hives and the, and the temperature probes is you can actually get a you can find out what's going inside your beehive and you can you know you you can see what's going on um, this is actually an apma hive here and you can see that the temperature um, in this particular one the 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 temperature here is moves up and down by pretty big swings but it stays in a relatively narrow band um, this the temperature probe in this hive is um, I have three medium boxes and this temperature probe that you're looking at is at the top of the bottom box. And I have a second probe, it doesn't show up on the screen, that is at the very top of the hive. So when I see that, when I see the bees move up past that thing, the, when they move up above that bottom, that bottom probe, the temperature drops and the temperature above stays up. So it's a way to monitor those kinds of things. But the real issue here is about the weight. Um, your bees are going to constant as long as they're flying in and out of the hive. There's the weight's going to go up and down, but they're going to work, and they're going to um, they're going to dry that honey out, and they're going to be constantly moving it around. This is the thing that blows me away is when you look inside of a beehive. You know, you can put a they'll I, they'll take a capped frame of honey and shift it around inside the hive to make it be meet their needs for the queen. Especially that you'll see this when she's laying eggs. Not so much now, but you know, in the spring and the summer, she'll move, move honey around like mad. I don't know if I really answered your question, um, but. Uh, no, it, that, it uh, gave me 50, 50 more. Um, uh, is there too. some <laughs> instrument that you could recommend to someone with a small apiary, like just two hives for monitoring temperature, humidity, and weight? Um, yeah, I, and I'm not, again, I'm not a salesman here, but I gotta tell you, go to them just, Get online and go to Broodminder, these guys. Um, I was an early adopter of these guys and they are, you can buy a, you can buy a temperature, a single temperature probe for 30 bucks that you can stick into your beehive and it will, um, if, if your beehives are close to your house, you can Bluetooth right to your phone. So I can, you can, I can walk out to my beehives with this thing. This data is coming through a, a cell phone data aggregator. It's a gizmo that sits out of my, my, my beehives are 10 miles away from my house. So if I want to look at what's going on in the winter, I don't want to have to drive out there all the time. This way, I've got a, a satellite link or a cell phone link to my beehives and it, it, the, the data comes in. I look at my beehives. I can tell what's going on. You know, I can, I'll, and here's one of the biggest things. I've actually had circumstances where I looked at my beehives and I was like, wait a minute, the, the, the scale weight went to zero. 
what the hell happened? And I was like, oh, wait a minute, there was a big windstorm. I went out there and uh, one of my beehives blew right off the stand and it was on the ground laying over on the side and had, had uh, popped open. And I went and bees were pretty pissed off. I reassembled everything, put it back on the stand. And of course, that was the thing that triggered in me into ratchet straps. So all of my hives are ratchet strapped together now. Um, but um, I think that having instruments on your hives can be helpful. Ape of May hives are really nice. The instruments work pretty well in them. Broodminder devices are relatively inexpensive. They're, they're, the, they're the least expensive scales and they're the least expensive um, temperature probes. Um, it's, even if you're, even if you, if you just are doing this for a lark because you wanna kind of have a peek inside your beehives without opening things up, it's not a bad way to go. They're pretty cheap. Just to uh, follow up with uh, uh, Peter's comment, from our lecture on Tuesday night, Bill Hesbach had said when he insulates his hives, he uses uh, the foil lined hives or foil wrapped hives that has foils on either both faces or one face. Um, Peter uh, had an issue with that yeah. with his brood minders um, that prevents the signal from going through. Yeah, so really nice if therapy. you're thinking about adding um, sensors to your hive, which, which is a good thing and I'll be doing next year, just be aware that of the insulation, if you're also planning on getting insulation, um, the sort of the foil line won't work with your sensors. The, the truth be known, if you look at the addition of foil to the insulation and Bill Hesbach probably talked about it. And by the way, Bill Hesbach's, the, the, he, the, his work was part of where, he was part of the, the references for this talk I just gave. That guy is, dialed into the use of insulation and on beehives. And he has an article that's, and that he probably referenced that's in bee culture that is right down the line about this stuff. He's extraordinary. Um, but in terms of our value, insulation, you know, the, it's the polystyrene thickness that gives you the insulation. The, 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 uh, the, the, the foil lining on, on the, some of those kinds of insulation slabs, they don't add any insulation. They just give you a little bit more um, the ability bees. to reflect the heat back into the yeah. hive from the bees. Um, on the other hand, it prevents energy from the sun getting into the, into that as well. So, and this actually brings up an interesting thing. There are lots of people who worry about, man, if I insulate my beehives, won't the won't the bees will they will they be aware of what's going on, and will they know to go outside and take cleansing flights when it's warm outside? You know, are they going to figure out? Do they think that the the world is cold and barren outside or what? And it turns out that they monitor the temperature at the entrance of the beehive exquisitely. And they're constantly paying attention to that. So they're not sitting there with their hand on the wall of the beehive going, gee, I think it's warm out there. They're actually figuring it out from the data that comes into them right from the entrance to the hive. So don't be afraid to insulate your beehives if you're worried about that aspect. Sure. And following up with that, David Spector had a question um, he was wondering what time do we uh, add the bee cozy or the insulation? And you and I were speaking about this before the, uh, t your talk began. Um, but do you want to go ahead and answer that? Um, I'd be putting it on now if you want, if you, if you, it, yeah. it, it, I don't think, first of all, it's not a rush. It's not like it's, uh, you know, you could have, you could have had you know, been insulating your hives two weeks ago and you can probably still be insulating your hives, you know, for another, you know, month and a half if you want to. So it's not like there's some great thing, but the benefit to the bees is going to be when the insulation is on the hive. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you get That's a bigger actually, bang, a bigger benefit if you do it now. That's one of my experiments planned for next year is set up a nuke and, or set up a pair of nukes and have one that's insulated throughout the year and one that's not and yeah. just see how they, uh, how they perform. Yeah, this is something that I found out is, is that my insulated hives, the, either the Listen hives or my Apamay hives, in general, without any added insulation on them because they have a higher R value, the bees do better in those hives. That's just my opinion and, my, and, and what I see in um, how, how quickly the queen kicks into gear, how much 
things. They sock away, you know, I get all the bees in the high in, in my in my apiary, they all have access to the same stores, you know, to the to the same forage. And so you you'd expect that for in, you know, across the apiary, you should see pretty similar kinds of of you know capability in the bees and stuff. Um, it's you know, it's like all of my hives in my in my apiary are all medium depth hives. I don't have any deeps. Um, because I'm a 68 year old guy and I don't need to have a bad back by lifting these boxes, okay? But what I found is, is that by having these insulated boxes, I have a much, um, the bees do better. That's all I can tell you about that. Um, sure. When I go back and I look at the data on my, you know, on, on, on what I get out of my bees, the numbers tell me that. Excellent. Jim Toll had a question about um, insulation and ventilation. Uh, whether we should use mouse guards instead of uh, mouse screens instead of entrance reducers. Um, uh, you said you keep your entrances small. I keep an, uh, a mouse guard on my colonies uh, year long. Um, yep. John Mandler uh, had a question about uh, a vent up the top. Do you have any sort of top ventilation in your colonies? Um, that's an interesting thing. You know, it's like I have. Um, it's, uh, in, in my Ape May hives, no, um, because there isn't any entrance to the top of those things. There's, there's, you know, I, and I'm not going to drill a hole through one of these polystyrene hives, but in all of my other hives, all my wooden boxes, because I don't know which box is going to be on top. I have all of my, I use all of my, my hive bodies. They're interchangeable. They're all, you know, eight frame medium boxes and they all have, um, an entrance gate with a circular disc on them that I can control for either just close it off, have some ventilation, have a queen excluder, in, you know, so the queen can't get out of there, or I have a, a, a wide open uh, thing that I can kind of shutter. So all of my boxes have that kind of thing. And I was just down there today and I was looking at one of my most successful hives going into winter. And it's, you know, the, all the, the, the apiary is set up that right now everything is three medium depth boxes high. Um, they're all set up like that. Um, they're all going along and, you know, most of my hives are doing okay. I've got eight, I've got eight full-sized hives and some nukes that are, you know, side-by-side -side nukes. And uh, I've got a couple of crappy hives, but most of the ones that are doing pretty well, um, they, the, the wooden ones do in fact have a top entrance. As soon as I put that um, insulation on it, they're gone. Those interests, and I. This is this is. I made this decision last year on the basis of how my bees behaved with closed-off beehives and fully insulated. A lot of people put in. You know, a lot of the reasoning for having a top entrance in beehives, when you read in the literature, is that I've got my. I, I've deep snow, and my bottom entrances are blocked. My bees need to get out, and they. That's that's attacked. That's a totally legitimate reason to have a top entrance. All of my bees, all of my, my hives are on tables that are about 18 inches to two feet tall. So unless we, it's pretty rare around here in the Boston area for us to have snow for a, for a, for a period of time that is that deep where it would be covering the bottom entrances of my beehives. And if that's the case, if I got snow that deep, I'm out in the apiary and I've shoveled the bottoms of my boxes off, but all the tops of them are closed right now. Not at this moment, but will be when I put the insulation on. Excellent. What are your opinions I on- I want to say one thing. Yep. You, you said, I want to say one thing. We all know the story about when you get 10 beekeepers in a room, there are at least 10 opinions about how things go. And opinions are worth what you pay for them. So, <laughs> so don't take what I'm telling you as the gospel. Go out yeah. and make your own experiments and do this kind of stuff. Apiary is that by their very nature are just are just experiments that are running along. And you can either choose to control the experiment and set it up so you find out differences or not, and just let them run wild, but um, try these things. Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a long time <coughs> member, uh, Gus Germanisch, uh, I always butcher his name, um, and he always encouraged new beekeepers to try. Just go out, experiment, see how it works. Uh, because it's the best way to learn. And sometimes you, you know, you, it's a harsh lesson, but you, you go out and experiment, try. And yeah. that's the great advantage of having more than one colony. 
or having a couple of nukes going along uh, when you're practicing along. I mean, if I was a commercial beekeeper and I made my living off this, first of all, by the time I got to be to that point of being a commercial beekeeper, I probably have worked out a method that I liked. And, but every commercial beekeeper that I've ever talked to is willing to embrace change when they see that it makes a difference for them. Um, you know, they want to, you know, you, when you, you, when you talk to big commercial beekeepers, um, I was at a meeting up in Canada um, last year and I just happened to sit down at, at lunch with a guy and I said, so you're out there in Manitoba, how many colonies do you run? And he goes, eh, we're not that big. I've got 8,000 colonies. And I'm like, this guy's got more colonies than are in all of Massachusetts, you know? Well, they maybe not literally, but he is a big league beekeeper. And I asked him, this is a question that I asked him. I said, so in the wintertime, do you go inside your hives? Do you, do you inspect your hives? And he says, oh yeah. He says, we go around and we inspect every beehive in the dead of winter. And I said, how do you do that? And he says, my guys go out and they ride around in a little, you know, like one of those little four wheelers and they come up to every beehive and they open it up and they, they have a little vacuum cleaner kind of a thing. They take a peek and they do, do a little quick zip and they suck a few bees into a, into a, this little vacuum thing, put them into a bag and move on to the next hive. So they, they get a peek inside there. They know how much the hives weigh and they get a sample to look at the physical health of their bees. And I was like, you do that for 8,000 colonies. And he goes, yeah. So you can, there's a lot of stuff that you can, that you, you shouldn't be afraid to go into your colonies, but what you should be afraid of is opening them up for a long time. It doesn't hurt to take a little peek, find out they need food and slip a patty in there. Um, I think the, that it's, it's something that you can, you need, to, you need to know what's going on to make those decisions. Sure. What are your opinions on quilt boards, Vivaldi boards, wood chips, burlap at the top of the colony? Um, I think they're not a bad idea. I had I used a Vivaldi board for a year or so, and um, if you think about it, what a Vivaldi board is is it's a or a quilt board. They're really a big, huge layer of um, medium to low quality insulation that can absorb some moisture. Now, if that thing freezes up because it's got so much moisture in it, then it's essentially a brick of water. So what you want to do is. Um, it's, if you can use it as a way to, to make the ventilation come out of the top of your hive through that thing, but have it insulated up, up above that so there's not a stark temperature gradient there and you're not going to get a lot of, you know, it's not just gonna come up and condense on there. That's, that's a pretty useful thing. Um, I, I met a beekeeper last year who did this really clever thing. He, um, he put a, a hive body on top of his hive. You know, he's a pretty conventional guy and he, he had insulated his hive. But he wanted to avoid that, that issue where water would come up and condense on the underside of the top board. So what he did was he, inside of that, that hive body, he took two planks of, of polystyrene foam and made a little tent out of them. He just put a couple of sheet metal screws into the sides of the box. These things could come and they could rest on those sheet metal screws. And the same thing at the bottom in the corners of it. This thing just plops on top of the thing. And then he has, what he has is he has another block of uh, polystyrene insulation inside of that box above it. So he's got a tremendous R value and any moisture that does condense on that inner surface just comes up and it runs out to the outer walls and drips down there instead of pooling on a flat surface and then dripping down in the middle. It's kind of like a cathedral ceiling for his hive. It's a pretty clever idea and that I think has some merit. Um, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat, you know, that, to get, to get this, this, this thing done. And if you take the tack of not insulating your hives, you definitely need to do something to control condensation in the top of your, of your, your, your bee, you know, your apiary, your, not your apiary, your beehives. And you need to deal with that. One way to do it is to control the flow of air through your, your colony. I mean, if you think about it, if, if you have a lot of insulation, the con condensation is going to happen at a very minor level, and then it's going to become thermoneutral, and there's not going to be any temp Remember how I, how I talked that, that heat doesn't move between things unless one of them is hotter than the other one, and it's going to go from the hotter, hotter object to the colder object. That's going to be the way that this is going to work out. Um, yeah, it's, I, I have to be honest, I'm pretty convinced that insulation is, is a key issue here. Um, I would encourage you guys to take a peek at some of Tom Seeley's stuff about the kind of, kind of um, 
homes that feral bees choose. You know, these are bees that get no treatment. They have, they are functionally organic bees. They survive pretty well, you know, and the, the, a lot of it that they do is through the, the, the kind of home that they choose. So they've got tremendous insulation. They don't have a lot of airflow for the other things. And one of the things that they found out was, is that there are bees, bees in the, uh, actively control the, ca the carbon dioxide level inside of their, their, um, colony spaces, and they use it as a way to control, to secondarily control their metabolism level. Um, it's a way for them to, to limit the amount of energy that they spend on just being bees. Um, yep. Something His latest book about. is called The Lives of Bees, and it, cool. it's, it's a tremendous read. It's, it's really, uh, he's a brilliant uh, researcher, not only on, on what he does, but um, he's one of the few people that can uh, really put it into simple terms, and he's extremely eloquent. His his books are 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 just wonderful reads. He's um, also his books called the Live the Lives of Bees, yep. and uh, we highly recommend it. We had that uh, as a reading book for one of our monthly uh, study group meetings, and it's uh, wonderful. You know, he's also happens to be one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. You know, he's just a really nice man. And uh, the students that come out of his laboratory are first rate. Um, I think one of them, this guy, David Peck, is going to speak at the Mass B meeting that's coming up this, you know, you know in a month or so. Yes. So worth, worth going listening to him. Definitely. Anybody that comes out of, out of, out of um, Seeley's lab, you know, Juliana Rangel or any of those people are always worth listening to. So. Sure. Bernie had a question about the reflexive, uh, reflective, uh, bubble wrap. You oh. gave it a value of about 1.2. Yeah, that, that's that's per inch. Per inch of that bubble wrap, or is... all those all those values that I showed yep. were our values calculated per inch of thickness of materials. So, okay. um, the, at at that level, um, I used Reflectix for a couple of years. Um, I, it was a really convenient thing to do. It just zip wraps around. It makes a nice air barrier. So it's kind of like it's kind of like the souped up version of tar paper. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a little bit of insulation and it has um, a reflective barrier. So it, it controls radiant losses. It's, it's a pretty reasonable thing to do. And I, I have to say, if that's, if, if that's the only thing you're going to do, that's a good thing to do. Um, you can, the, I'm a huge fan of insulation. That doesn't mean my bees have, you know, this much polystyrene foam on them. They got two inches of polystyrene foam. They come in, you know, at about, at that point, they're coming in at about R9 plus on a, on a you know, by the time you add everything up, you're, it's, it's coming pretty close to an R10 wall. And then on top of the beehive, I go as much as three inches of foam up there just to tie it all up. Yeah. And they're surrounded by chloroplast so that there's no air leakage. Sure. So what do you think the uh, R value of the chlor chloroplast is? But I'm going to uh, guess that uh, it's, half? Probably, it's, it's, it's per inch. It's probably about the same, you know, because what it is, it's a captive air barrier. You know, I found, I found, I found a technical spec on it while I was listening. Oh, it's good. It's 0.078 uh, per millimeter, so 25 millimeters, which is about the max you can buy, is 1.95. So here's a question for you, Bernie. The one, the the big thick coroplast. I don't know. Why has it big cells. Cell. Telephone. And wondering what, if that's if would you rather have several layers of the smaller cells so you'd have less air movement in them? Yeah. It's kind of getting a little geeky here. But. Yeah, I'd like to have less, so I'll, I'll, I'll try it. Yeah. So, no, that's great. Thank you very much, Bernie. Okay. So, um, Randy had a question. Uh, provide information on the scale. So you use Broodminder. So yep. the Broodminder has a uh, scale that has a temperature as well as a humidity probe of some sort. They do. Um, the, their scales, they make two scales now. They make a, one of their scales is a, is, a, is a single bar that's the thickness of a two by four. So you put a two by four under the front of your hive and the, and the scale or, and, and at the other end of the hive, you under the thing, you put this, this bar. And what it has, it has String gauge sensors in it that when you they sense the, the the force bearing down on top of it. They also make a 
So it effectively weighs one half of the hive. You know, it weighs either the front or the back half of the hive, depending on where the thing is sitting. Um, it also has a temperature sensor in it so that you know what the outside, the ambient temperature is outside of the, the, the colony. Let's see if we can do something here. Let's look at something here. If you take a look at this, um, so if, if you look at this gray line here, this is the outside temperature. I don't know if you can see it there. That is the outside temperature, uh, you know, on, on this thing. I don't have a second, you know, temperature probe out there. This is just the one that happens to be under the scale. Um, they make now they make us a, a, a new scale that has temperature that has um, it functionally weighs the front and the back half of the of the hive. It measures so that you get the entire um, weight of the hive, and that thing is like a slatted bottom board. And this has a very has an interesting functionality in that you could have this thing sitting on top of the brood boxes of your hive and between your brood boxes and your supers and use it as a way to monitor just the change of weight caused by honey buildup, by, you know, nectar flow. And it would ignore, because it's above where all the bulk of the bees would be, it would be ignoring what goes on in the brood chamber. So they've done some pretty cool things. Um, it's, you know, they make, a, they make a nice product. There are several, there's one called... Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Honeybee Solutions, I think, is the name of the company. There's, um, there was recently about two weeks ago, there was a really nice conference online about hive monitoring. And there are loads of people out there who are making really cool tools to put in your beehives. Some of them are really aimed at commercial beekeepers. You know, they're relatively small devices that they don't measure the weight of the beehive, but they listen to what's going on and they take temperature and humidity measurements. Um, some of these things are pretty amazing. Um, but as far as scales go, I'm a big fan of the, of the brood miners because they're simple and they're not very expensive, you know, relatively speaking. Um, the, you can buy what they call their citizen science kit. I think it's like 250 bucks. It's a scale and two probes. One is just a temperature only. The other one is a temperature and humidity probe. So you can put the temperature and humidity probe in the top of your colony. You know, like if, let's say you got two deeps one, the temperature probe would be going in, go in above the bottom brood box. And then the other one, the, the temperature and humidity probe would go in above the second box, right underneath your top board. And uh, then the whole thing sits on, on the scale. Um, they're pretty nice. Um, they, they, I have to be honest with you. This, what they will do is they will give you a little peek inside of your hives. There is, they, Broodminder has lined themselves up with a French company called Melosphera, these guys over here. And what Melosphera does is that they take the data from your beehives and they bring it into actionable, actionable use. Let's see if I can get, open this puppy up. They give you actionable data on your, on your bees. I don't know if I'm gonna get it to go tonight, but oh, here we go. And so what I've done is um, if, if I go to all of my, all of my, um, you can, you can put the pictures of your beehives in on this side. And then for every hive that you have, you can, you can um, click on everything. It will just go chapter and verse right down the line. Let's see if I can find myself to, uh, I want to get to this one. Yeah. So this is a picture of my apiary and we can open up. These guys are, this is telling me that, that this Ape May PB7 has, um, you know, it's, it's telling me that, that, the, that the temperature and the brood qualities are in, in good shape. Um, they give you some actionable data here. You can make some things. You can take notes on the other side of this thing so you can, you know, see what's going on with them, how much, you know, how much you fed them when you treated them. It's kind of a, a, a more sophisticated way of doing that kind of stuff. Not necessarily the best, but it's very useful information. Um, by the way, here is, this is a, a listen uh, new, this is a listen uh, nuke, a six frame nuke. This is a, uh, where is, let's find our way over here. I can't see it. Hiding in the back here, actually right there is a, a, an Ape May hive that actually has an Ape May top and bottom board and wooden bodies on it. Um, because I use medium stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't until this year that Ape May came out with a bottom board that could take their, what they consider to be supers and use them as hive bodies to mate with their bottom board. So they came out with that this year and I have now got a couple of those guys. Anyway, kind of being distracted here. Yep. Fun, fun, fun. Um, let's see how you answered this one. 
Uh, last B event. Okay, so uh, I think one or two more questions. Actually, I think you've covered everything um, that people have put in the chat. Sure. Excellent. So uh, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please I, I let do. me know. Okay, yeah, I, sure. I, I have one more question. You know me, I always have a question. Peter, this is a really great presentation. I love learning from you. Thank you so much. Um, and. Uh, this is what I do have two ape of my hives, but whether I had them or not, based on your um, uh, description of feral bees preferring in nature an insulated tree trunk that is highly insulated and has one entrance and the entrance is near the bottom. During winter, would you say it's best to only have a lower entrance or to have that ventilation that goes up through the top and out much, well, in my case, I have two ape in my hives and there's lots of ventilation that goes out through the top, as you know. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, there's, it's an interesting thing about those. I have functionally blocked off the insulation, uh, the, the, the exit of the air out of the top of my hives by encasing them in the, a, a, a coroplast wrapper. So my hives are more and more and more approaching the airflow um, milieu uh, that you might see in a tree trunk. Um, and I insulate the living crap out of everything. Um, so does their naturally rising condensation just roll down the, the sides of the hive? Is it, where does it end up going? I mean, like in yeah, a tree? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. If you take a look at what, what uh, if, you, if you go and take a peek inside of the lives of bees, uh, Seeley's book, he's got, he talks in there about um, bees being in these feral colonies and what goes on is sort of the, the moisture dynamics inside of these, these, um, these trees. One thing I understand is the, the colonies that bees are looking at inside, you know, that feral bees, they are not choosing to move into a gigantic, tall, you know, let's just put this in perspective. A single 10 frame deep is about 40 liters in volume. Okay. Um, the sort of the, the classic size that a feral bee colony is, they come in between 40 and 60 liters. So they're, you know, they're one and a half deeps worth of volume and not anymore. And they, they don't get to be adjusted like we slap on supers, okay? But you wanna, you wanna provide your bees as you come into winter, you wanna bring the volume of that beehive down to the smallest amount of volume that those bees can, that, it, you know, they, they need a certain amount of, of stores to make it through winter. And they, and okay, here's my latest experiment. Now that we're going to open the door on this one, I took a 10 frame Ape May colony that, that, and I moved a, 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 a colony or a Ape, Ape May hive, and I moved that was, um, it's three mediums high. And I had a 10 frame or an eight frame one in a conventional wooden, wooden setup. And what I did was I took, um, I basically made follower boards out of one inch thick slabs of foam and put them on the sides of, the, of each of those boxes. So I insulated, added another inch of insulation, but this time inside of the beehive. And I put my eight frames inside of that. This is gonna be my experiment for the winter. I've got one that's set up with just 10 frames across and I have one that's set up with eight frames, but it has an extra inch of insulation on each side of them. So that's, that's Pete's experiment for the going forward for this this uh, winter. Stay tuned. I'll let you know what goes on this winter. Those both of those colonies are roaring along right now. They're they've got a, a lot of bees and a lot of stores in them. So hmm, that's really cool. And my question about the trees is: Do the do the does the topmost surface of those trees do they tend to be sort of conical in shape? Sort of you talked about like the vaulted ceiling and. Um, Tom Seal, you know, those, those, or because the flat roof is where that condensation can happen if it's cold. I guess maybe not if you have like oodles and oodles of insulation. But if you, if, if you have a flat roof, then you get that flat area that can drip down. Would yeah. you say maybe it's a, a, a cool idea or a better idea to have more of a conical so that if condensation hits it, it can roll to the sides? I think, a, I think it's a perfectly reasonable way to go. You know, it's like, if you look at the, ins, if you ever get a chance to find a bee tree that's fallen, 
And a friend of mine called me up earlier in the year and he says, he, was over, he lives over by the Blue Hills and he says, you got to come and check this thing out. Maybe you can get the bees. And it was a bee tree that had the big windstorm hit and this thing cracked off and splattered across a trail. And uh, it was, uh, the, if, you know, looking at this thing, the, first of all, the cool part was the inside of the, of the thing was completely covered with propolis all the way up. And it came, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like squared off at the top. It was just this sort of raggedy thing at the top and all, but it was all covered with, with um, propolis on the inside. And the, you could see the combs that were hanging down inside of the thing. But by the time I got to it, the combs had been ravaged by a bunch of animals and the bees were all out of there. But it was interesting to take a look at that. And so the, the bees have made us functionally by putting you know, a layer of propolis around the inside of the, the colony, they put a waterproof antibiotic um, layer of material on the inside of their house. Because the truth is, is that bees have a pretty crappy immune system as individual, as individual bugs. When you get them all together they, as a super organism, now because of, of, of you know, cooperative behavior, they have a very robust um, immune system. And part of that robust immune system is, is that they actively work to make their, the, the sort of, what's the word for it? Uh, the, 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 I think it's called the ecotype. It's the, 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 the environment that they live in, they control it as part of their behavior to have a better immune system, a better immune function. So they, they, they're kind of, kind of hitting a whole bunch of things here. They, they, have, they choose an insulated place that has a not a squared off top or a flat top that might drip down on them. I'm sure that you can find a bee tree someplace that has a, in fact, has a, you know, a thing that looks like a, a weird kind of internal cavity where the water could drip down on them. But my guess is that the bees are not going to be really successful in a volume like that. They're going to choose, you know, you know, it's like you can find people who live in crappy houses and you can find people who live in really cool houses. So I think you, uh, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly from, from some of our study group, uh, discussions that the dew point in your colonies never approached the um uh that the humidity level didn't approach the condensation point or the dew point that they were still able to maintain even though it was humid in there it was going to be sort of uh super saturated yeah it's it's or maybe it's, that was well, uh, right before your discussion during your Cornell presentation. Yeah, let's with, see if um, I can find something here for you. Let's go back. Let's take a look at some data in this particular thing. This is the joy of numbers. So I don't know if I'm going to find any of the information that I want. So this production battery, blah blah. That's this one. I'm not going to be able to see what we want here. So. This is just temperature data here. I don't, this one doesn't, this one in particular does not actually have a humidity probe in it. But mm. the, uh, let's see if I can find the one that does. Boom, boom, boom. Hello. Numbers, numbers, numbers. All right, let's try these guys. Looks pretty messy, doesn't it? But take a look at this. So here's the humidity level, and this is going back into November of last year. So here we are. This is about this time last year, and the humidity level in that in this hive is the outside humidity level on this particular day was 93%. Okay, and inside the beehive, it's about 70%. And it is, if you look at it, it's remark, it's relatively stable across all this time. There are a couple of swings up and down, and here we get into. And now we're going into we're getting into into February and the, the humidity inside this hive is plummeting. Okay, the outside we're still getting these big huge swings. You know they go from really low. This is a brutally cold day. That's going to be the outside humidity is twenty six percent. That's a really dry day. But really soon thereafter the temperature the humidities are up. You know here's some of them they're up in the ninety percent. So but if you look at this if you kind of give it the squinty eye look. Pretty stable here, starts to drop here, gradually builds back up over the forage season as the bees are pushing more and more moisture in and out of the hive. But the time when we all think about humidity and its importance is this period of time right here. 
and the bees are actively controlling the amount of humidity inside the hive and they're gradually ramping it down. They're taking, you know, they got, there are two sources of humidity inside that, inside of that uh, beehive. One is their food, the amount of, 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 uh, of, of honey that they're consuming. And if you remember those diagrams that I showed, if you got a kilogram of honey or you, you, know, you have a, a, a single kilogram of honey, 80% of that is sugar. 20% of that is, is water. And there's a little smidgen of other stuff in there, but functionally it's either sugar or water. And as you go along, if, as those bees consume that stuff, they not only have water that's tied up that they just release as part of the, 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 the honey, as they metabolize the sugar, those carbohydrate molecules get, get hydrolyzed and part of that is blown off as water. So there's, there is a ton of water tied up inside the actual sugar itself. So that's what's going on here in this part of the, in this part of the thing is these bees are, are, are they, they managed to re keep a remarkably um, steady amount of humidity inside the beehive. And they, this, these guys cranked right through winter. They did great. Um, and the other part of it is the bees themselves. They're made out of, there's a lot, you know, a huge part of them is water. So it's, uh, it's, the, the more you look at the instrumentation, when you start poking around inside your beehives, you start going, why did that happen? I wonder why, I wonder why this is. And then you could start going reading, you find yourself off in some tangent about humidity and beehives. And there's a ton of information out there that's good quality stuff that's in the scientific literature, not in the journal of YouTube. Really important. The journal of YouTube is by and large crap. So not that I have an yeah. opinion on the topic. <laughs> um, at one point you had mentioned a webinar, a recent webinar on uh, thermo thermodynamics of beehives. Um, um, there's, there's a I couple of things that are going on. There was, a, there was a, the guy that I, that I was talking about was, um, that's Derek Mitchell. Um, I went, it wasn't a webinar. It was actually a, a um, I went and I was at, I got to see him speak at Epimondia la last year up in Montreal. And mm -hmm. he's, um, he's a very clever guy. And he, he's, he's not your normal beekeeper. This is a guy who's a, a thermal fluidics engineer, which is sort of this little sliver of, 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 of temperature engineering that is about, um, it's, it's usually guys that work in heat plants and in nuclear, um, in nuclear facilities are the guy, the, those guys. But he's done a ton of work looking at beehives and how do you redesign a beehive to favor the bees instead of the beekeepers? You know, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Why do we have beehives that are three quarters of an inch thick, made out of three quarters of an inch thick wood? Anybody got an answer? It's the convenient material they find around. But why three quarters of an inch thick? Wait. It goes back to World War II. There was a period of time during World War II. Before then, the the, the standard thickness of wood, especially in, in you you go look at Britain, where there a lot of this stuff was developed, they used pretty thick stuff, you know, one to two inch thick boards. And when they came into World War II, they started developing uh, the war effort. They needed to conserve all of the wood that they can but they needed to generate as much as much sugar as they could because beekeeping was the one place that the British population and even here in the United States where they could get um, sugar for their use at home. Um, and so the beekeepers went to thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner boards in an effort to let the war effort have more and more wood. And out of that came some of the, there's a, there the aircraft, the Mosquito and a whole bunch of other wooden fighter planes that were built in World War II. And that was one of the things that drove the beekeeping industry in England to embrace these thinner and thinner boards. And it just settled out that if you look at, um, it's a three quarter inch thick board that is functionally what's in, in the construction world is a, is a one inch board, okay? And that's what they came down to. So it's, it, it's not done because the bees like it. It's not done because it favors the bees. It's done because of other factors. Um, and nowadays you, when you go in and you can, you can, it's, it's the thickness of wood that is stable enough to be structurally solid and not so thick that it's expensive. You know, if you look at some of these Lazutin hives made their Russian style hives, they're pretty much made with two inch thick boards. Um, and they got much better insulation in them. They also have some other strange things. They're really, really, really deep cones, but you know, you can, you can make your beehives any way you like. So. 
Uh, final question. Um, Allison was had a question about the your experiment for this year with the follower bo follower boards uh, being made out of foam. Yep. Are are you worried about the bees chewing through those or having access to those? Do you have a uh, sort of a veneer face on them, or I'll let nope. you go. Um, I've had polystyrene hives now for a bunch of years. Um, listen hives and the bees have never been in the bugs that have chewed through them. Um, the first time I ever encountered a bug that chewed its way through a piece of polystyrene was I had some VMAX um, hive top feeders. They're the basically big tanks of polystyrene that sit on top of the beehive. And uh, they really are nice. They keep the, 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 the syrup is not this cold problem that the bees have to deal with because it's insulated. But when the ants figure it, figure it out, the ants are really cool and clever about just drilling a hole right through the side of those things. And all of a sudden there's this nice arcing stream of syrup cascading out of the side of that feeder. That's the only time I've ever seen a bug make its way through polystyrene. The bees, no problem with it. I've never had a bee um, you know, make its way through any of that kind of stuff. When I insulate the outside of my beehives, I'll tell you one thing I do that's not for the bugs it's, or the bees, it's for me. I actually wrap um, something called zip tape around the outside of the, uh, of the planks. And it's only to make them a little easier for me to handle and to get rid of this, um, the crumbs that come off of these boards. Um, so when I cut these things, I cut them and then I brush them like mad to get all the little crumbs of stuff off of them. And for those follower boards, they were, um, it just turned out that those one inch thick boards were gonna make it so that I could have enough room inside of my beehive to put eight full frames and give me a little bit of extra insulation, so. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, it's my pleasure, wonderful. really fun. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, if anyone has any other questions, you can contact me and I'll uh, pass your information on to Peter. Um, and he can uh, do any follow-up. We're going to go ahead and start the, the basic business meeting or, or some announcements and then have a general question and answer um, period for members. Uh, Philip, I'm going to go ahead and um, make you... Oh, I'm sorry. I had Philip. I'm here. Oh, here you are. Well, Tony, I'm going to check I'm out gonna... and I'll talk to you guys later. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Yep. Bye bye. This is a lot of fun. Yep. Take care. So I'm going to go ahead. Peter, I've made you, uh, or Philip, I've made you a co host for the talk. So we have a few announcements. One is that um, we have four more t shirt orders to fulfill, and then our um, uh, we've gotten t-shirts out to everyone who's ordered them over the course of the year. We have six more medium t-shirts of the beekeepers helping beekeepers and a whole bunch of larges and extra larges. So if you haven't placed an order for t-shirts, we still have uh, a couple of mediums and plenty of larges and extra larges for you if you'd like. Um, coming up in two weeks or actually a week and a half, uh, Saturday, November 7th, is the Mass Bee Meeting, which uh, our club is hosting, uh, albeit virtually. But two of our members, Phil, uh, Philip Thomas, our vice president, and John Cheetah, one of our directors, uh, they've done a tremendous amount of work. And it's going to be a great event. It's going to be online, 8 a.m. to noon, with a couple of speakers, and then we'll have a, an hour long question and answer period with vendors available from uh, noon to 1 p.m. Um, you can uh, join for $15 for the uh, Mass Bee membership, and uh, it promises to be a great day. So I'm looking forward to it and um, highly recommend it. So we have a couple of other. Uh, speakers coming up in November. We're going to have Bill Hesbach um, back on, I believe it's November 10th, 
And then we have someone else scheduled, I think currently on the 17th and uh, announcements will be going out uh, for those talks. And uh, t-shirts, Mass B, um, upcoming lectures. And it's uh, almost that time of year where uh, you can renew your membership. We have a brand new payment portal. So you can, rather than filling out a form and bringing a check or cash to meetings, since we're not meeting uh, in person, you can go ahead and sign up online. You can pay for a single year membership, two years, or I think we currently have it up to three years. You can pay for uh, three years up front and not have to worry about running out a check every single year. So um, that's an option online. We'll start pushing that at the end of November into December and again into the new year. Uh, Philip, do you have anything else? Any other uh, club business or announcements? I, I just want to make two quick comments. First of all, the registration is open for the Mass B event. And uh, please go ahead and, and register for that so that uh, we have a sense of how many uh, how many people are going to be showing up. The, the Q&A at noon from noon to 1 is both with the vendors like Man Lake and Better Bee and Rick Rowe and, and uh, uh, Dan Conlon from Warm Colors Apiaries, but it also includes the speakers themselves. So David Peck uh, and, and the other speakers will be available. Um, secondly, I'd like to ask the members a question in terms of the format for these meetings. Um, we, we're thinking that more often shorter meetings like this one hour meeting would be preferable for the time being for the next few months. Is there anyone that would like to comment whether that's a good idea, bad idea, or there's a better idea? You can either uh, put something into the chat or you can sort of unmute yourselves and and answer at will. Um, you can do a reaction too. If you click on reaction, you can do a thumbs up or a thumbs down or whatever that would be helpful as well. Sure. Uh, but feedback would be greatly appreciated. Um, okay, so uh, you can let us know. Uh, Randy says shorter is better. I definitely prefer shorter meetings than, than longer meetings. Um, we're gonna, uh, I guess we can open it up for questions and uh, Q and A, if you have any questions about what's going on in your hives, what you should be doing this time of year, uh, you can go ahead, uh, post in chat or ask away. Um, I need to step away for a moment to take care of a family situation. I'll be back in two minutes, but uh, Philip, if you can take over for a moment. Um, I got I'll it. Be right back. So someone did ask about whether we should be feeding uh, this time of year. Does anybody want to comment on that? Uh, Philip, so that, so this is David. I asked the question. Um, I'm concerned because uh, I did do some feeding between September 1st and November uh, and October 15th, but with all the uh, the wet weather. I'm concerned the bees are sort of eating up their stores right now. Um, and I know that it's pretty cold right now to be feeding uh, liquid uh, sugar water. Can we start with the with the, uh, the, the sugar cakes at this point or anything else? Uh, there are winter patties available, I believe, too. Uh, that's an option. Uh, sugar itself in one of these uh, round top uh, sugar feeders. John Cheatham, do you have any thoughts on this? John, are you there? I'm here, Phil. Um, I mean, why, you know, your, your bees would normally this time of year just, you know, they're they're clustered and they're not like, you know, they're not flying, you know, yes, it's going to get cold and it's going to snow. Yeah, but they're bees, they'll, they'll handle it. I mean, when you're fed, you know, did you're trying to get a target weight or how much, how many frames of capped honey you hope? If they have it, then there's really nothing you know you should worry about. It's not like they're going to all of a sudden run out of food. Okay. They got plenty of your bees should have your hives should have plenty of food. Yeah, David, it depends on if your hives have been pretty heavy. Have you, have you checked them? Have you done a tilt test or anything like that to see if you've got good strong 
stores in the hive uh, because they should have 50, 60, 70 pounds of honey that would take them through the next couple of months ostensibly, uh, depending on the, the in, you know, the intensity of the winter. So they should be in pretty good shape. Is anybody feeding their bees now? I, I know this is not a good time for syrup, but are, are you feeding anything else? Okay, I agree with John. I think the you know the bees are going to parse, parcel it out, and there'll be a few warm days coming up next week. Supposedly, I think Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're back in the mid 60s, so there might be some flying and some additional work on the part of the bees. But right now, they're they're kind of hunkered down for the winter, and uh, they're going to be you know less activity means less consumption and, and less energy need uh, needs for them. Any other questions? So we'll keep an eye on the clock. I see there's a comment here about running over, which we're doing right now. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get this down pat and make sure that we have a speaker for like 50 minutes, have some time for business or Q&A, and then wrap it up after an hour. I'll talk with Tony more about that. Any other head scratchers out there? This is kind of a, we've had a couple of good runs this week in terms of winter preparation. It sounds like we're, we're in good shape. All right. Well, listen, we'll just close out the meeting and uh, we'll send out a notice on the next one. Thank you all for being here. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.